Okay, I've got it. Okay, so welcome, folks, to uh, hear Uri Talil tell us about it, what we can, um, what Americans can do now that the Israeli-Palestine peace seems to be unattainable. And this is what uh, a second try. We tried this in September, and it there were technical problems, so we're doing it again today. Uh, so I'm going to take the. Uh, that off the screen. I'm going to put that back on the screen to just remind you what's coming up. And what's coming up is, I don't know why I can't find it. Uh, in next month, with Tony Litwinko as a host, will be Thea Dal Asha. Uh, talk Dalasha. about it. Dal Asha. Dyer Dal Asha. Anyway, is the third intifada about to start? <clears throat> On March 20th, uh, Chuck and Dick, Chuck O'Connell and Dick Platkin will give a critical analysis of Ken Burns' Holocaust film. On April 17th, we have Tariq Kennedy Shawa, Shawa uh, who is a young man who works uh, for uh, a Palestinian activist group in New York. And he's going he just wrote an article challenging anti boycott legislation in the US and he will talk to us about that. Uh, so with that I will come out of this and Uri is going to talk about is the uh, uh, a peace still attainable, and we all know who Uri is. Uh, <laughs> and he's a longtime member he a uh, member of our group he left Israel in about 40 some odd years ago. 50. And, he's, and, he, and through the years here in Los Angeles, he's been active against the occupation in a whole series of different ways. And he's been a good member of our group for many years. So with that, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Uri. And if he wants to enlarge his introduction, go right ahead. So Uri. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, it's now, changed to over 50 years now. I left before the 73 war. So uh, first of all, everybody, thank you very much for listening and tuning in. Uh, I'm probably going to talk about the subject 30 to 45 minutes. A lot of the points I'm just going to touch on. I'm not going to dwell into very deeply because it's a very wide subject. Some of the points, if later on there are questions, I would be more than happy to, to talk a whole lot more specifically about certain issues. So uh, first of all, as a preamble, I just want to tell you, every time that you hear me criticizing Israel, uh, it doesn't mean that I exonerate anybody else. This is not like the Western Hollywood movies. When you see somebody wearing the, the dark head, the other side is the white one. And I, I, there's plenty of guilt to go all over for everybody else. So me criticizing the Israeli government doesn't mean that the other sides are good. I want to make sure that because a lot of fine people say, you never say anything about the other side. So uh, the a lot of times I would use interchangeably Israel I, re I relate to it as the Israeli governments in plural. So in other words, a lot of what has been done since 1948 was done by and in the name of Israeli governments. I, when I say Israel, that, that's usually what I mean. Otherwise I'll specifically tell you if I blame somebody specifically. So that's kind of like a, as ways of introduction. And, uh, Jeff put a question, is an Israeli-Palestinian peace resolution still attainable? What can we as Americans do now, if anything? So if you're waiting for my answer, the answer is no. Now we can go home. <laughs> so what can we do about it? Very little as citizens, because we as citizens, we can do very little about our government because as somebody says long time ago, it's bought and paid for a long time ago. So unless we are Elon Musk and they have enough money and willing to spend it, we can influence very little because even the Congress has very little influence on the direction. 
So that's kind of as like an introduction. Now, the first question, when you say the Palestinian-Israeli solution, that means you're assuming there's a problem. And when you assume there's a problem, you need to define it. And you also assume somewhere that there is a solution for every problem. So this is the first thing I'm challenging. First of all, not every uh, political situation has a solution. And sometimes when they have solutions, it's not really in the scope of what we're talking about, which we usually assume a peaceful, nonviolent solution. There are solutions to a lot of issues. Look at what's happening with Russia and Ukraine. The Russian decided to do a, a, a forceful solution. So we are not considering that kind of a thing as a viable at least I'm not considering right now because uh, you can have the conversation and certain elements in Israel believe in that. They basically say they, they're not hesitant to say that we can live on our soul. We beat them. I don't know how many rounds. We'll do another 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 rounds if we have to. It's kind of like a perpetual mobile. Every few years we have a conflict. So... That's one thing with regards to how do you define how do you find the problem? And the question is it does this does this, a military solution possible or even is acceptable? This is two questions with big questions. Now, uh, one of the things that I want to actually put up uh, in you try in trying to define the problem. First of all, you have to assume a few things. So some people basically say this is a religious messianic conflict between the Israelis, the Palestinians, and the Arabs. It's not the same entities. Some people say, no, this is basically just a, a fight over territory, over land, and it's a secular fight, and secular fights can be resolved. Right there you have issue because there's about 80 million uh, evangelistic people in the United States who influence the United States government that basically think that for, for their sake, that defining it as a messianic thing is good because they believe in the second coming and there's a process for the second coming. And part of it has to be the Armageddon, uh, Gog and Magog, and the Jews have to to fight, and then the second coming, they'll have a choice to convert or not. So that's one solution. I don't talk about it because it's not part of the, the whatever we consider, but the 60 to 80 million Americans will live in that. So I just wanted to, 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 to throw that into the hopper because is it a religious conflict? Is it a national conflict? What kind of a conflict is? And based on the definition or the agreement of what kind of a conflict, you're probably going to get solution, if at all. Now, part of the part of the uh, the the criticism that has been uh, launched is that some elements in the Israeli society believe that they can live the next 75 years or next 750 years relying on the might of the Israeli army. That's a belief. We cannot prove it either way, but there's a lot of people who doubt it. So that's kind of like another element into this conversation that we're having. Who do you ask and how do they define the conflict? Um, Okay, uh, now we come to another, another question, which is even if there is a solution, and I'm talking from the Israeli perspective, this, this conversation pretty much, I, I, I don't even assume to represent the other side. Uh, the, the question, let's say we can solve that conflict, what price, what, what's the price of it? What does the state of Israel, what the, do the people of Israel have to pay for that? 
and is the price worthwhile? And there's a lot of people who said that uh, they're not interested because they're clear that they'll have to negotiate on semi level playing field because uh, some of the people have solutions that basically are Pax Israeliana. That means we dictate the terms because we are the stronger one and we'll tell them how to do, and that's the way it is. You take it or leave it kind of uh, approach. Uh, if, we, if, we, if we go back at least to 67, and I want to touch on that thing, a few, a few points about it. Uh, when the Israel won the military victory in 67, the, the, the government of Israel and the leadership of Israel were in shock. They were, were surprised because they did not plan for that. That kind of got them by, by surprise, big surprise. And you can, if you go back and check the, termi the terminology, because in politics, terminology makes a big difference. The first year, 67, 68, the various names that the political discourse in Israel took about those territories that Israel won from Egypt and, and Jordan and from the, the Syria. One of the terms was the beholden territories. In other words, the thinking in the first year, it was at least we are holding this thing as a bargaining chip in order to finally get some kind of a peace solution that we couldn't attain in 1948. In other words, we'll be able to strike peace agreements with all the Arab countries and we can settle the issue with the Palestinian one way or another, because now we have something to offer. Before we had nothing to offer. So that was something that was floating in the Israeli political milieu for the first year or two. At the same time, and I'm referring right now to something that most people are not aware of. Levi Eshkol, who was the prime minister in 67, right, right after the, the whole thing settled, he summoned over uh, David Kimchi. David Kimchi was later on the director general of the Israeli foreign office, but he was, uh, uh, he was in the deputy of the Mossad and he was a spy and, Anyhow, he, he summoned him and he says, go tell me what's happening in the West Bank, because the Israeli government had, had no clue what was happening really in the West Bank. And he, he went with another guy or two, and about two weeks later, he came back to Eshkol and he actually proposed. He told him, listen, there is a way to handle the West Bank in our favor. And the proposal was very simple. It says, listen, the West Bank has about seven or eight or nine big tribal families. In each city, there was one or two, like in Jerusalem, there was the, the uh, Husseini and uh, Nashashibi and, and Khalidi and in and, and, uh, Hebron, you have the Kawasma and uh, Jabri. In each, in each big city in the West Bank, there was one or two major family, and it was a tribal. He says, we can offer these seven, eight, nine tribals, each one of them, full autonomy on all their civil matters. We, as the state of Israel, going to get an agreement by which we, the Israelis, are going to control the foreign the foreign affairs and the military affairs. Other than that, you Palestinians can do anything you want, and it would be a hundred times better than what you got with King Hussein, who never recognized your aspiration. We're gonna let you handle your own. In other words, we're gonna basically continue support or propagate the, I don't know what to call them, but this is kind of like the Middle East, patriarchal society where the elder of the tribes run the show. It's not about civil society. It's not about democracy. It's about running the affairs the way they want to run their own affairs, which for the most part is being held 
and done in a lot of the places, including, in, including the West Bank nowadays even. So uh, let me ask you, just table that thing. He decided not to decide because he had a lot of other pulling other elements. And if some of you remember, within two or three months, there was a very strong movement that was created. And it was created, it was called um, the movement for uh, the full Eretz Israel, the full state of Israel. And the, 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 the composition of the people was very interesting. Half of them was from the right, which was expected, because this is people who never lost the idea that the whole, the whole, the whole Israel from the river to the sea, if not even the eastern part of Jordan, would be part of the greater Israel. But the second part that came, that was the surprising part. These were people who were part of the Labour Party. A lot of people from Machdut Avodah, Alon, Galili, Tabankin, Ben Aaron, this is the people who joined them. And all of a sudden, 67, there was a big fervor. These people who were secular, socialists, who believe in all kinds of values, all of a sudden, they started talking messianic. They started talking, we are gonna do something with it because now that we were able to complete what we didn't do in 48. A lot of these people were disappointed that in 48, Israel was too weak to, to conquer the whole thing, especially that Jordan with the uh, Jordanian Legion who was a very organized army. They couldn't do anything against them. So they said, this is our second chance 20 years later, and we're going to make it correct right now. So that was part of the conversation in 67, 68 that was thrown into the whole environment of the political, political million Israel, because there was a conversation. What are we going to do with this thing? Now, there were a lot of other people at that time who said, basically, this is not going to fly. You cannot, after Second War and the United Nations, just go conquer some other territory and decide that this is yours for whatever reason, you pull the Bible, whatever other justifications. So even, even the people who believed in that, they said, well, let's play for time. Let's not decide this thing and let's see if we can get away with it bits by pieces. So for the first, I don't know, three or four or five years, it was not really, really settled. The only people who really moved on it was the ultra-Messianic part of the, the Israeli concern, Israeli, which then there were small people, small group. This is like uh, Rav Levinger, April 68, he, he came to the government and says, I want to renew in Hebron, that was a Jewish city from until 29 when the Jews were killed there, I want to have a Passover Seder in Hebron to reestablish our existence there after we've been kicked out or killed from there. And the Israeli government gave them permission, even though they didn't have to, because it was a military controlled area and it was really controlled by the military. The Israeli government with a wink and a nod and it was Israel Galili and Eagle alone. They basically wanted to ride the tiger. They figured these are the new Zionists. This is the new real visionary. Instead of taking the socialists that ran out of steam and they started worrying about how can they improve their st standard of living, we're going to use these people as the new socialist. So with the week and an odd, they gave him the permission to do a stay there for one week. Malone Park, in other words, he went to a Arab a Palestinian a hotel and he paid as a, as a guest and he did the seder there and they never left since. And the Israeli government acquiesced about it. This is something that a lot of the people forgot about or don't want to remember or, and that was the beginning. Now, there's a few other points in that thing, and a lot of people remember how Shimon Peres in 74 with Sebastia, he convinced Sabin at the time, yeah. was a prime minister, to let them settle in the meantime. In, yeah. in other words, there was, never, there was never a decision. 
decision was never made, but they wanted to figure if we hold on to that long time, we'll be able to increase our ability to negotiate and get parts of it. So that was the main thinking. In 77, when Begin got into, the, into uh, power, one of the first thing he said, he went and he says, Alon More was one, the first settlement that the Israeli government by Peres and Rabin let them stay. He went and in, in a public statement to the whole citizen of Israel, but especially the West Bank, he says, there's gonna be a thousand Alon More. In other words, we're gonna populate all this thing. Official statement by Begin, he said it in 77. So that was really the shift in the public opinion of the Israeli government, as far as what they're gonna do with the, not that the previous 10 years they didn't, but they didn't have the political surety that they can get away with it vis-a-vis -vis the United Nations and, and the United States. So that's just kind of like a background to how all of a sudden there was such an understanding and agreement, at least partial agreement, in Israel with regards to holding on to that. And one of the justification was, there was in 67, the Arab League had a conference in Khartoum, Sudan. And they came with the three no's, not to recognition of Israel, not to peace of Israel, and uh, uh, I forgot the third one. And basically Israel used that thing. You see? They hate us, they want to kill us, they don't recognize us, they don't want us. In other words, that was a very convincing political argument that was handed to the Israeli governments ever since then. So the, and this is, I'm doing a segue, but I, I heard from a lot of people in the political science, they basically say, you have to consider the issue of the Holocaust. How did the Holocaust and the establishment of the state of Israel and the resonance that stayed with the generation after that impacted the whole conversation about the future of Israel and the future of peace settlement with the Palestinians and the Arabs. In other words, somehow, at least in the mind of some politician and some Israelis, they, they transferred the Holocaust from Europe, and they put it on the shoulders of the Arabs. The Arabs are interested, the Arabs with no distinction, Palestinians, Arab, in Israel, Arabs are Arabs. In other words, there are 22 countries, all of them are the same. Don't confuse me with distinctions. They all wanna kill us. They all wanna throw us to the ocean. And this is, by the way, a still a pop popular belief in parts of the Israeli populace. There's no way to do a peace with them. You can't trust them. They want to kill us. They just, and they, some of them, the smart one pulled the example from, from the Quran, say that there are two kinds of peace amongst the Muslims, a temporary peace and the real peace and the two different words. And they're going to do a, a temporary, but when they be stronger, they'll kill us. So there's the resonance of the fear of the Holocaust which is now third generation, but there's still people who survived the Holocaust who still live in Israel. And this is a very important factor that runs in the backgrounds of all political conversations that a lot of people in Israel either don't wanna consider or not aware or ignore it, but it, it's there, it's, a, it's in the background. Uh, okay. Okay, now uh, throwing another thing into the into the into the hopper. Even though the 1947 United States resolution about creating two democratic states, the Israeli one and the Palestinian one, it it's part of the resolution, <laughs> and Israel went through the motion. And in order to create a democracy, you need a constitutional assembly that gets together, writes the constitution, 
declares a, an election and disperses itself, and then people go to election based on the new constitution. This is the process in all democracies in the world, pretty much. Egypt in 2011, after the Tahrir Square and all that, they did it. It was a constitutional <laughs> assembly. They wrote the constitution and they dispersed and went to election. Jews are smarter. Jews don't do this thing because they're better and smarter. Excuse my cynicism. As soon as there was a constitutional assembly, a Sefah Mechonenet, in 1949, January 49, there was election to the constitutional assembly in Israel, a Sefah Mechonenet. They, after they sworn in, they declared themselves as the first Israeli Knesset. In other words, don't bother us with this stupidity of the goyim of doing a constitutional assembly and writing a constitution. That was nice. We're not going to be bothered with it. There was one person out of the 120 who stood up in the Israeli Knesset at the time and says, guys, this is a putsch. You're actually circumventing your mandate. You were supposed to write the constitution and you're not doing it. Now, the point, and I read a lot of people, a lot of people talking about it. Ben Gurion didn't really want a constitution because he could force the point. He had the power to do almost anything in the state of Israel in 1949. And for whatever political reasons, personal reasons, and others, he did not want it. I basically heard a lot of time he says. He realized that he would be limited to eight years as prime minister, was not interested in that. He actually was there from 48 to 63. He did 15 years stint with a short, a short, he took a year off. So that's one of the things. The other thing is the, the state of Israel never, never defined its borders. Any country that establishes itself, the first thing they do, they define the borders. Israel refused to do that up to this day. The cynic says because they always wanted the big Israel by the Bible. So why limit yourself to certain limits and then say, hey, you violate it. Right now we are flexible. We can, we can declare anything part of, uh, uh, part of Israel. So this is a cynical approach to this thing, but Somebody tried to convince me otherwise. And basically, when you look at the behavior of Israel, you realize that there's a lot of validity to that thing. So the constitution would have actually uh, bound their hands. The joke I heard about it was a different joke. My father told me, he says, do you know why Ben-Gurion refused to declare Israel as a kingdom? Because the Bible says Israel was a kingdom. I says, no, I don't. He says, Ben-Gurion couldn't fathom the idea that he would be called King David II. <laughs> now, jokes aside, the part of the whole thing is that uh, the, the whole issue of when you start a state, you also have to decide what it's going to be. Jews don't want a decision, so they say it's going to be Jewish and democratic. That's an oxymoron. Anybody who knows anything about democracy know there's no such thing. You cannot do that. It's either or, not both. But of course, go argue political science with Jews. They know better. So this is the formula that Israel has been living under, Jewish and democratic. Obviously, it's not Jewish and it's not democratic. It's neither. But it's very easy in order to avoid the conversations of how do you create the law of return, for instance, that give preference only to Jews to become citizens, not to anybody else, unless you said this is a Jewish and democratic. Jews because we want the Jews. Democratic when we when, when decide what's democracy. So this is kind of like I'm giving you some background, and I'm sure a lot of them, a lot of you heard about it. And, and know about it. I'm just kind of giving you points as to how come I don't see a resolution to this thing. Now, uh, I'm jumping now. 
one of the stumbling blocks in every conversation about settlement of the issue was the right of return. And most Israelis, when you, they hear the right of return, this is like becoming, you're talking like, no way. Even though there were conversation about it when Rabin had the conversation and then Barak had conversation and Ehud Olmert's conversation, the idea was basically Israel is gonna recognize the right of the Palestinian, the right of return to Palestinians as a general declaration of rights. We recognize that right, because without that, the Palestinians are not going to sign anything. However, how do you implement it? The fact that you have a right, it's nice. How do you get to implementation? Now, the implementation says we're going to agree that the next 10 or 20 years, five or 10,000 Palestinians, and we, we define who they are and what they are, under the repatriation or f family repatriation, we're gonna let them back and that would be the right of return. And there's gonna be, uh, we'll, pay, we'll, pay, we'll pay reparation. We'll find something, the Americans, the Europeans to pay reparation to all of them. So that was an agreed upon aspect of it that Israel never said loud, aloud, but that was part of the, the conversation that they, uh, Rabin did in 93, 95 Oslo, and then Ehud Barak when he was uh, in uh, Camp David, and then also uh, Ehud Olmark. So I'm just, I'm pointing to this thing because this is, this is the red line or the, the, the no way in 90% of the Israelis will never agree to the right of return because they envision five or seven million Palestinians coming into the state of Israel. So they're not, that's a no-go. So they finessed the issue, but it never got into because. Uh, okay. Uh, the, one of the proofs is in the pudding. Uh, if you wanna talk about how come how come there's no peace or there's no resolution? You look at the consequences, 75 years later. And by the way, I saw all of you, I have a book that shows, it was in 1972, issued the book before the 73 war. It says the peaceful proposal, 1948, 1972. There's about 40, 40 peaceful proposal, how to resolve the issue. As if the issue was a matter of just, you need to get the right combination of proposal and then there's gonna be a peace agreement. The issue was not a proposal. The issue was the fact that Israel for the most part didn't want any peace resolution. And they basically, especially in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, the Bibi uh, governments made a decision we are going to manage the conflict. They call, it, they call it management of the conflict. Management of the conflict means this is going to be a 100-year problem. And every year, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 Israelis are going to be killed by what they call terrorist uh, thing. Basically, the Palestinians fighting for their, for their independence. This is a manageable price that the Israeli government is willing to pay in order to keep the situation pretty much the way it is, undefined. And they say, as long as the United States gives us the umbrella of the veto in the United Nations Security Council, nothing can pass there against us on this issue. Even though there's a lot of resolutions in the General Assembly, it's meaningless. The Security Council, the five main ones, if they agree and they do sanctions, that happens. So Israel is small. Russia, on the other hand, for example, in the issue of Ukraine is not afraid because they can have a veto, nothing, no, no sanction. So the sanction was done outside of the United Nations Security Council. So I'm just kind of like giving you the, the thinking in Israel, as long as the United States is gonna give us the umbrella, we are cool. We don't have to resolve it. Now, uh, 
the, the last point I want to make, Arik Sharon basically wanted to make decisions by setting the ground, the ground, by forcing the ground. And he basically devised since the 77 or 78, when he was a minister, minister of uh, agriculture, and then he was the minister of defense. And he was basically, he was a hands-on guy. And he basically took the map of the West Bank and he decided to make it like a Swiss cheese. So there's no contiguous ability to have a Palestinian state despite, despite of the resolution. And for the most part, he succeeded. Plus, you have to realize the state of Israel is small. The way the state of Israel enticed a lot of people to move to the other side, in their wildest dream, most of these people could have not have afforded the size and the luxury of their residence in Israel. They could get on the, on the, on the other side. On the other side, they got plenty of land and plenty of everything. So even if somebody decides to do it now, it's it's irreversible. And I'm not the one saying it. Uh, 40 years ago, Meron Ben Benisti, he was a deputy mayor of Jerusalem. He was in charge of trying to integrate Jerusalem, right? He was the deputy of Teddy Kolek. He said it basically in the 80s. There's no way, there's no way now to separate the West Bank from Israel and the settlers. And this is like when there were maybe 100,000 of them. Now there's over half a million. And 50 to 100,000 of them are real hard, hard right, hard wing, hard right people who will who do it for messianic reason. Mm -hmm. The other three quarters of them, I mean, one third of them is religious people who moved there because it was cheaper. They have big families, they don't have a a way to live in Israel to buy an apartment, so it's easy. So Betar Elite and Modi'in Elite has about 300,000 citizens who are there because they're ultra-Orthodox, they don't care about the politics. Anyhow, so this is kind of like I'm throwing another thing into the hopper. I, I'd better stop here because I spoke for almost about 40 minutes, open it to questions and what if and buts and what happened and explanation, go ahead. Okay, thank you, you Uri. And while we're waiting for people to raise a hand or uh, put their electronic hand up, let me just ask a very quick question. Sure. From the way you describe things, there's really very little difference between governments run by labor and its predecessors and by Likud and its predecessors, certainly between 48 and 67. And from 67 almost to 2000, there's really no difference. It, it's it, it's as a straight line almost. You're absolutely right. And the reason is very simple. The old Zionist. What's the mantra of the Zionist pro, uh, uh, propaganda? From, from a, a land without people to people without land. So the differences was very semantic, very small between the right and the left. In other words, they basically believe that everything is the state of Israel. Everything belongs to, to us. Just because in 48, we're not strong enough. Okay, we are making up for it in 67 and we'll do it later. So essentially you pointed to something true. The Israeli governments were Zionist governments. Zionism is almost a state religion in Israel. Even merits, when they ran, they always have to say first thing, oh, we are Zionist. In other words, you have to declare the fact that you're Zionist, otherwise you're outside the consensus. You're almost considered like to be a traitor. So yes, you're right. The distinction is very minute. Thank you. Dick, your hands up and you're muted. Uh, or, uh, there's something I've always wondered, wondered about, maybe you can answer it. You know, I've been to okay. South Africa a lot and in South Africa, unity between between blacks and whites was always the uh, strategy and the goal of the <coughs> ANC. And uh, they opposed uh, black nationalism and white nationalism, whether it was from the Afrikaners or, uh, or from uh, different 
uh, anti-apartheid, but black nationalist parties. In Israel, both the uh, Labour Party and all the right, uh, Likud and all the right-wing parties are opposed to Palestinian nationalism, even though Palestinian nationalism wants to keep separate from Israel and their, their desire is not to have one uh, state, but their desire is to have a state of their own. So why is, what, what explains this real antipathy to any expression of Palestinian nationalism? Why don't they just say, yeah, we're, we're happy to have Palestinian nationalism because it's not gonna threaten us. Internationalism is the real threat. I mean, I've always wondered the difference between South Africa and Israel. Okay, so I'll try to answer it. First of all, you have to realize some people in Israel say, yes, there is a Palestinian nationalism. Jordan is your state, go move there. We'll be happy to accommodate you. You live in the, the east side of the Jordan River, the, what we call the, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. This is your country, terrific. We'll help you even move there. This is the right-wingers, always. They always say that. They always say the Jordan River to the sea is ours. The other side is yours, no problem. And this is part of what uh, King Hussein was always afraid. He was afraid of that thing that the Israelis will accommodate. And when he kicked the PLO in 1970 in the Black September, because they, they basically got the, the whiff from the Israelis that Israelis is going to control the West Bank. So move to the other side, we'll help you. So this is kind of a kind of the thing now, as it turned out to be, Israel, Israel told the Syrian, don't, don't dare because we'll invade you. So that's how he was able to kick them to Lebanon. And Israel shifted the problem from the West Bank to Lebanon. And then in 82, Arik Sharon wanted to solve the issue in Lebanon. And the history talks about it. So I, I'm not sure that it answer your question, but essentially the, it's, the issues are kind of different. In other words, some of the Israelis don't mind that the Palestinians will have their own state, but not here. Somewhere else it's fine. There's 22 countries. Why do you come to us? We have a little thing. Go to the rest of the Arab world. So I don't know, does that answer? Well, let me give you uh, an example. I've, I've read a lot about the big demonstration that took place in uh, Tel Aviv over the weekend. Yes. And uh, I think the report in the LA Times said, and a few people even had, an, had a Palestinian flag, but they were, they were rather defensive about having a Palestinian flag at this uh, anti-government. The Palestinian flags were ripped out of their hands. Yeah, in other words, Palestinian, any expression of Palestinian nationalism, even if it's sympathy from Jews, is considered an, a, a don't go there type of thing. It's very different than South Africa. And, uh, you know, I, even, I, even I, among people who are uh, anti, uh, opposed to this right wing government, they have very little support for Palestinian nationalism. Because most of the Israelis accepted the fact that this is not an issue that we want to fight. In other words, we're fighting Bibi and the right wing government and all that. The occupation is a small sliver of the Israeli populace who really talk about occupation. 80% of the people who went to, to demonstrate uh, Saturday in Israel, there was a big fight. They told them, don't bring the Palestinian flag because we're going to get bad publicity. Because in Israel, you put the Palestinian flag, this is a red, it's a red herring. It's right, you can't do that because right away, all the cameras on it, and you see, you see, this is the people, this is the people who want to destroy the state of Israel. These are the traitors. So because they understand the, the prevailing uh, public opinion in Israel, they asked them not to do that. And essentially they said 80% or 90% of the people who came to demonstrate are not interested in the occupation. They don't define the problem as occupation. They don't look upon as occupation. The, the, the Palestinian is the issue that they don't want to deal with. We want to deal with right now. They're stealing our personal rights. So I don't know if that, it's an answer, but I'm not an expert on the South African issues. Uh, Dick, did you have a follow-up or should we? 
I'll uh Rick, do you have a follow up or should we go to Yossi? Go to Yossi, go to okay, Yossi. Yeah, I'd like to try to uh maybe give a, an additional answer to uh, the question about why they don't accept the Palestinian nationalism. Well, if I'll be more accurate about mainstream Israel, let's say like uh, the political party of Lapid, which is now the largest mainstream, if I can call it, that basically replaced the Labour Party. Labour Party have been marginalized to four seats in the parliament. They're telling you that they accept Palestinian nationalism. However, when you start talking about where it's going to be implemented, they're basically talking maybe, uh, maybe half of the West Bank. In other words, they're offering the Palestinians something that no Palestinians with self-respect will accept. When Lapid started his political career, his first stop was in the settlement of Ariel, which is one of the largest settlements, maybe the largest in the West Bank. It's a city already. It's not like a, an outpost. And he mentioned to people in Ariel that this will be part of Israel. It's not negotiable. So in one side, they saying, yeah, we accept Palestinian nationalism, but in our term, Palestinian nationalism, which is basically a, a kind of a Batustan that doesn't mean too much. And this is like a lip service of resolving the conflict. He said, look, we offer them like Barak, we offer them uh, the world and they reject it. Okay. But when you start looking at the details, how do you say the expression, the, detail, the devil in the details, right? Of Barack proposal in 2000, you see that he wanted to uh, have part of the Jordan Valley and the major settlements and all Jerusalem and so on and on and on. And basically offering a Palestinians a humiliating solution that it's not really respecting their full national sovereignty, something like this. And this is why they basically was an excuse not to resolve this. When I was in Israel in 2022, I was in the Israeli parliament. This was under Lapid Bennett government. And the speaker of the house, which was from Yesh Atid, from the Lapid party. Uh, I came as a member of the Abraham Initiative Board and we went to the parliament to meet. So he told us straightforward, he, he told the, the guest of all Abraham Initiative, he said, under this government, there will not be a Palestinian state, period. That's it, this was the end of discussion without explaining why. He said, it's not gonna happen. So when he's saying that it's not gonna happen because they know whatever they're gonna offer, if you know a Palestinian, let's say in 67 border with a small modification here and there, the previous Israeli government will not, maybe the only one person who offered the Palestinian some uh, more dignity was Ulmrand, but when he offered this, he was no longer a sitting prime minister. He was already resigned. So he was prime minister of, of Keitel uh, government. They don't have no jurisdiction. They didn't have no authority to make no decisions. Then he told Mahmoud Abbas, I offer you 94%. Mahmoud Abbas came back with 98 and a half and uh, basically went to nowhere. And this was the last more respected offer. Everybody else later, including Lapid, Lapid made very clear that this piece is part of Israel. So they will tell you, yeah, I recognize Palestinian nationalism, but I determine what this is mean. So this is what really mainstream Zionists of Lapid today, 
or what they call the center of uh, the political party. And then you have the right wing who made very clear, it's not even the agenda. The agenda is that uh, in this current, the new government, the agenda is that the Jewish people have an exclusive right of all the land of Israel from the river to the sea. And they're the only one who have a right there, period. And this government will continue to build uh, settlements and building uh, what they call a Jewish, expand the Jewish present all over Israel and only for Jews, period. So they just make it very clear. They don't even recognize Palestinian nationalism. But this is more or less the, the, the differences, you know. Uh, it's like what happened to the Native American. Yeah, you have some rights, but you have to know your limit. Here is not, here is not, here is not, and this is the mainstream. And then the right wing say they don't even exist here in the United States. So it's, it's I can more make a, a similarity when one term in the history of the US, they created a map of what they call Indian country, which was huge area, but then they start taking pieces of it until it's left a small piece in Oklahoma you know, through a few 20, 30 years, they reduce it to a small piece of Oklahoma. So this is similar to this. I think the difference is in South Africa, 80% of the population uh, were blacks, you know, and they had enough power with, the, with support of the international community to basically to bring apartheid to its knees. It's not the case of Israel. The international community overall, I mean, the most powerful countries that include United States, European Union, Russia, and China, they willing to live with the Israeli occupation and make business with them. Make business with them, you know? And everything else, what they're saying about Palestinian rights is no more than just lip service, especially from China and Russia, you know? They don't really mean seriously. Their business relationship with Israel is more important than Palestinian rights. And of course, United States is the main power. Okay, I'm done. Dick, do you want to respond? You asking me? No, I'm. He basically described a, cer a certain element within within Israel that uh, Israel has moved to the right in the last 50 years. Just think about it. 40 years ago, after the Sabra and Shatila, roughly 400,000 Israelis were shocked that the Israeli government would actually stand and let a bunch of others kill uh, civilians in cold blood. 400,000 people came out and protested. They asked that question about a year ago, if Sabah and Shatila happened now, when Bibi was the prime minister, how many people do you think would come? Somebody says maybe 10,000 at best, which shows you how the state of Israel moved to the right. And part of it, part of the move to the right is a very simple, basic, but ingenious way. The Israeli government in 1977 you see, from 48 to 77, the Labor Party never relinquished the Ministry of Education because the socialist and the left always understand if you hold the education, you hold the future. 77, they lost the election. Begin chose Zvulun Hamer, who was a member of the old Mafdal, the old uh, religious party. And they changed the Israeli education system to the point that the younger generation, anybody who's 50 years and younger in Israel, for the most part, they do not understand what democracy means. They did questions, they asked them, and basically say, oh, democracy, if you win the election, you do whatever you want. What about protecting the rights of the minority? What? What is that? So they were able to shift the whole conversation from 
possibly being a democracy to basically, we are Jews, we can do anything we want. As long as the Americans with us, we are fine. We don't have to worry about anything. So it's a very cynical and it's a very schematic approach. But if you dig deep into, you realize that the shift was in the education system amongst other things. And at a certain point, the Israeli army stopped being really an army protecting against other nations. The Israeli army became basically an occupation force, which is basically the way the police was in the United States in before 1960 was an occupying force to make sure that the blacks know their place. And this is really 80% of what the Israeli army does is basically to make sure that the Palestinians know their place. And because it's very hard to separate because after all, there's 100,000 Palestinians who work in Israel on a daily basis. Israel cannot construct anything without the Palestinians. Like I spoke with uh, Victor before, there are no Israelis working at the constructions. They're managers, maybe, but no laborers. So the, the situation is such that Israel cannot, cannot tolerate the whole thing that some people will come and tell them, hey, we have rights. No, you don't have rights. We are the Jews. We control. It's a Jewish democracy. They tell them, listen, look. Between the Jordan Sea and, and the ocean, you have 50-50% demography. This is the thing that basically started to come loom. They say, okay, you don't want to stay at ocean? No problem. We'll do one. No, we don't. We want the Jewish state without the Arabs. So we want the land without the people. Good luck. Start another war. Anyhow, any other comments or questions? Yeah, I, I, uh, I have another short one if no one else has one. And uh, you said after 67, the Israelis were shocked, shocked that they controlled so much land. Yeah. And I, I, I guess you're talking about the political types because yes. the military types were pretty sure that they were going to have that victory. Yes. But the issue for them, they are military. They are not supposed to handle the po politics of it. They say, we protected Israel. We knew we can do it. Now, politicians do something. The politicians were behind the curve. They missed the whole thing because they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't, in their vision, they have no clue because from 48 to 67, the Palestinians and the Arabs were the enemy. All of a sudden, you need to do a peace. You need to settle with them. No. Who wants it? And besides, the issue, especially the main one, the, the right of return, that was clear to all Israeli politicians from 49. It's going to be an issue, the right of return. They were trying to finagle it. And ultimately, up till this day, Israel is not willing to recognize the right of return, even under certain conditions, say it's going to be a, a family reunification of, for 10 or 20 years or something like that. That's part of the part of the solution that were presented. Israel is not interested in that. They figure 55 years, maybe the world will forget about it. As long as the Americans are on our side, and as a side, I always say, Israel is basically the best salesperson for the military industrial complex of the United States. That's why we get three and a half billion dollars every year as a commission a salesperson for pushing the American uh, techno technocratic military weaponry. And, and this is basically a very cynical way to look upon it, but as somebody who promotes the American military industrial, which is really a very important facet of the American economy, three and a half billion dollars, it's, it's a drop in the bucket, $850 billion uh, budget for the military in the United States, the defense budget. Three and a half billion? Billion, billion. Yeah, I'm talking about billions. I mean, I'm talking about billion. three and a half billion out of 850. Okay, it's what, 4%? Big deal. No, it's, 
Okay, I, I'd like. I have another question, and then I'd like to look rather than backwards. Look forward. The International Court of Justice is going to apparently take up the issue of the legality of the occupation, and that essentially means. Is it an occupation, meaning it's something that's temporary, or is it permanent, i.e., is it already an annexation? And uh, uh, if, if, if all the Court of Justice does is look at the statements of the current government, the agreement, it's clearly permanent. So how do you see this Israeli Court of Justice playing out, and how is this going to go forward, and if they do in fact say it's permanent, what what is that gonna mean? Okay, generally speaking, nothing, because it, it's a, the, the General Assembly. So let's say in a year or two or three or four or five, they write their, their findings. It goes to the General Assembly, and the General Assembly, 100 to 25, gonna say that Israel is actually doing it permanently. Then what? As long as the Security Council the five permanent members are not willing to sanction Israel, nothing is going to come out of it. It's a nice theoretical conversation. It's nice. And they, they do something because uh, they always tell them, you use power, so don't use power. Do BDS. Say, no, don't do BDS. So now they're going to the legal route. The Israeli says, no, don't do that either. In other words, we don't want you to challenge us. So this is a nice challenge in whatever, however long it's going to take them. They usually don't, don't act very fast. In a few years, it's going to come to the General Assembly. The General Assembly is going to make a resolution. Yes, it is. So what? As long as there's no power of anybody to enforce Israel, and the United States is not going to do it. The moment the United States says, we are not giving you the automatic veto in the Security Council, to protect the 67 annexation, different ball game. Up till that thing, I don't see any change. And, and to go further, because Israel is the salesman for the industrial military complex, the US uh, is, isn't gonna change. The way we see it right now, I don't know. Uh, don't ask so, me what's so, going to happen here in five or 10 years, but yeah. essentially the way it looks like it was the last 55 years. So, so you know, they're really, you know, we talk about the Israeli lobby and we commonly think of APAC and its buddies. Yeah. But actually what you're saying is that there are two other important players. One is the Christian evangelicals. Uh, and yes. the other is the industrial military complex. Yes. And if you know who runs this country, the evangelical and the military industrial complex run this country. Well, I'd argue it's the industrial military complex more than the evangelicals, actually. Okay, I, one and two, fine. I'm not going to argue the who's hierarchy. But this is the two main factors that basically Israel has been factoring in. De facto. The so they it, actually support, support this. So if people like us and J Street argue enough and, and let's say, you know, APAC goes down and ADL goes down and a few of these other things go down and all, the only thing left standing is J Street and APN and IPF and a few things like that, that will not change anything because the evangelicals and the military complex yeah. want things to stay Which the same. Which reminds me of a question, famous question, that when they told Stalin about the Pope, the Pope was against, he says, how many division does the Pope have? So we are fighting the military industrial complex of the United States. What's the chances? They are right now writing a check for $50 billion for the Ukrainian to do their job to kill the Russians. It came from manna from heaven for them. They never thought that Putin would be stupid enough to do that. And the United States says for 50 billion, I'll give you another 50, kill the Russians. So it's a very cynical approach to this thing, but I'm looking at the whole thing and I'm saying, oh, there's only 3000 Abrams tank being set in the, in the Mojave Desert and in Arizona in Moss. There's 3000 tanks that the United States 
uh, the United States armed forces don't need. We can ship 3,000 of them to the Ukraine to fight, for, for instance. So in other words, what I'm saying is the cynical approach is a very simple one. The United States is an empire. They have allies. Israel is an ally of the empire. As long as the United States doesn't lose their perception of an empire and they don't lose their need to have allies to protect the, the empire all over, there's no real difference. And there's no real change to the whole thing, in my opinion. Okay. Okay. Let me ask another question. Only this time I want to ask it of Dick. Okay. Dick? <laughs> okay. How will Jeff Halper react if we start with the prem premise that uh, civil society has no has has no oomph? Ha, ha, you know, Jeff's one of Jeff's big things is civil society must work together to uh, to make things change. But what Uri is telling us is that that ain't going to do any good. You've got these other two big things: the evangelicals and the military complex. How would Jeff Halper react? And can you get Jeff Halper here to make his argument? You're muted. I don't know that particular answer. I, I do think that a lot of his constituents are in Europe, and uh, maybe people in Europe are more optimistic uh, than people in the United States, although I have a feeling that's probably changed. I do think that uh, Jeff Halper believes that uh, there is a one, there already is a one state solution and the challenge is to figure out how to turn an apartheid one state solution, which is the reality right now into a democratic solution. I have my quibbles with him because he doesn't uh, address the economic aspects of it and uh, both on the Israeli side and the Palestinian side, there's a lot of rich people, there's a lot of poor people, there's a small middle class, and uh, he acts as if there's uh, this broad swath of everyone who has the same interest on both sides, which I don't think is correct. And that's why I asked the, that question about South Africa, because in South Africa, the uh, there were a lot of uh, white opponents of apartheid who lined up with uh, uh, Africans, and there were a lot of Africans who didn't think there was any role for whites, so they formed their own uh, party. And I don't see that happening in Israel at this point. And as much as I'm supportive of the idea of a one-state solution, I don't think Jeff Halper's particular vision has grasped the uh, economic inequality on both sides. And he you know, anyway, that, that's that's not really answering your question, but I might be able to get him to speak. I mean, we've had a request out for a while, but not on this topic. Uh, let, me add, let me add my five cents into this thing. Basically, the right-wingers, especially Smotrich, Smotrich is a smart guy. He realizes the, the dilemma that they got. So, they're talking about accepting them. About, about accepting which group? The Palestinians. However, not as equals. In uh -huh. other words, you give them some limited civil rights. You don't let them vote. But you accept the fact that you need them. They're part of the society. They're part of the workforce. As long as they know their place. That's the point. Kind of like the words, East Jerusalem model. I'm sorry? There's the, the model of East Jerusalem where Palestinians can travel around Jerusalem, but they have no right to vote. And yeah, not they even can vote for their municipality, not the Knesset. In, in other words, they're looking for some kind of a resolution to incorporate the Palestinians into some kind of get 60 or 80% of them who are basically want to live peacefully and make a living or not ideologically inclined. And they say a lot of them realize that the PA, the Palestinian Authority, is corrupt. They don't want them. They say, we'd rather live under you because at least with you, we get, get some, we get ahead economically. So, in other words, 
the extreme right wing in Israel basically right now looks upon it and saying this, the resolution would be to get to some kind of an understanding with them that will give them a little bit more freedom and a little bit more economic freedom and all that as long as they understand that we are the boss. This is a Jewish state. Forget about democracy. We don't want democracy. Democracy is a bullshit conversation that Ben-Gurion accepted. We don't want democracy. We don't believe in democracy. The Bible is not democratic. Jews are not democratic. God promised us that's what we want. This is basically they're thinking about it. In other words, they are bothered by the whole demographic issue because they know what's happening. They say, hey, there is basically uh, if, uh, somewhere about 15 million people between the Jordan and the sea, and half of them pretty much are uh, non-Jews. And they said the rate it's happening in five or 10 or 15 years, the Jews are gonna be a minority in this thing. So they're trying to figure a way what, how can we resolve the issue in such a way that we would be able to maintain what we have right now and minimize the, the, the chances or the risk or the whole conflict to the point that we can actually accommodate them somehow. In other words, some like, somewhat like the model of the East Jerusalem or somewhat something like that. They'll know their place, it's Pax Israeliana. However, there's nobody who is a democracy in the Middle East. The Palestinians don't expect a democracy because we can all them Tell them, like they say, go to Jordan, go to Syria, go to Lebanon. What do you want from us? We are better than, we are treating them, we are treating you nicer than your brethren. Kind of like as if it helps them. But this is the Israeli part of the right wing that basically say, hey, you should be thankful that we don't treat you the same way Assad treats you. Kind of uh, approach. Now, very paternalistic, yes. But they say, hey, we're the Jews, we're strong, we write the rules, kind of an approach. Yeah. Awesome, Victor, Judy, the three of you haven't said anything, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll call it. Judy's got her hand up, so she's next. Unmute, unmute. Didn't Bush, didn't Bush cut off uh, all aid to didn't Bush do that to Israel at one point? Yeah, it's a good point. How did, in, how did in they 19, get away with that? In 1991, Papa Bush and it's especially Baker, they were pushing Shamir, who was the prime minister, to go to the Madrid conference. And he didn't want to because he Shamir said basically, don't bother me with this. So famously, Baker says. Here's the phone number of the State Department. When you're ready, call us. So essentially they told Israel, at the time Israel wanted $10 billion guarantees from the United States for loans because the Russians came to Israel after the collapse of the USSR. In 1991, Israel started getting tons of them and Israel couldn't build enough housing for them and all that. So they needed $10 billion uh, international guarantees from the United States for the loans. And that was the leverage that Bush and John Baker, Jim Baker applied to Shamir government. And that's how in 1991, they broke the jam and Israel went to the Madrid, Madrid conference, What's which the was Madrid the first conference. I'm sorry. What's the Madrid conference? The Madrid conference was a, a peace, a peace attempt resolution in 1991 that the, the parties involved were actually trying to negotiate some kind of a settlement to the whole thing, 1991. So the United States was really the sponsor and they pushed Shamir who was against it and the Palestinians were there. And some people believe that basically the Madrid conference was actually the beginning of the Oslo con, uh, process that came two years later. So the first seed was started in the Madrid conference where they were sitting around the table and talking, what can we do? How can we do it? This is 1991. The United States is the one main power. The USSR are disintegrated. So it's Pax Americana, whatever we say goes. So at the time there was the belief that that would be able to change the equation in the Middle East towards some kind of resolution. So this is like in two minutes capsule on the Madrid conference. I thought it was, I thought it was something about 
it wasn't it wasn't about the settlements. I thought that the U.S. was mad about the settlements. I mean, so it wasn't that about that at all. No, no, it was how how generally we're going to resolve the conflict. No, but how I don't can mean, we get I mean, to some kind of a peaceful resolution between Israel and the Palestinians? That was the all. So the government. So they were, we were upset about. They weren't upset about. It wasn't about that Israel was doing too many settlements. It was about that was. Leverage number the- 17 on the agenda. The point was very basically saying, okay, we are the Americans now rule the world. There's no USSR. How do we resolve the issue? Because Israel is a client of ours and we are actually interested to get you to be a client of ours as well because Egypt already had an agreement with Israel and the United States was pushing Jordan to go into an agreement, which happened in 94, three years later. So the United States at that time felt that they can run the, the Pax Americana, they can run the whole world order because we were number one, there's no Russia. Okay. So, Yo- Yossi, did you want to add to this? Yeah. I, uh, one of the objections of Shamir to go there, he said, I don't want to meet with the PLO. This was his official propaganda. So the Palestinian delegations, actually were leaders from the West Bank, led by Hanan Ashrawi. And Shamir, uh, like fool himself, he said, oh, this is not the PLO. But this was a joke because the PLO gets their approval for the Palestinian delegations. They all basically spoke as the policy of the PLO in the conference. The only problem was the conference they made in Madrid and this was the end of it from the United States. They never really push anything behind giving some speeches in Madrid. <coughs> Shamir sent his people. There was the Palestinian delegation who had been speaking the need for a Palestinian state in 67 border. And the United States said that, okay, now you guys negotiate. And everybody went home and there was no, nothing continue after this. And that was the last time that we ever, that the U.S. ever withheld money support for Israel? That was the last time? No, no, they just uh, put it on hold. They said they're going to put it on hold. And this was enough for Shamir to agree to go there. So they never hold the money. They, they gave them the, because he agreed to go. Uh, another an, another uh, uh, example where they threatened to use where it was uh, Jimmy Carter in 1978 when they had the Camp David Accord of with peace with Egypt. And Jimmy Carter threatened Menachem Begin that if you will not agree to withdraw from Sinai 100%, uh, he's going to pay a heavy price, including cutting aid to Israel. He told him personally this. It was a book, it's called 13 Days, about 13 days meeting in Camp David. So after the threat from Jimmy Carter, Ben uh, Begin withdraw and agree to uh, withdraw from Sinai with the protest, but he agreed to withdraw from 100% from under pressure from. Uh, United States or President of the United States, you know, but they never actually cut the aid ever since they start giving aid. They never touched this. It was continue and continue and continue. And besides, there was another element. All of a sudden, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait in 91. So there was the desert storm. All of a sudden, the issue of the Israelis and the Palestinians became secondary because the United States went to Kuwait. They need to get the coalition in the whole world. So they put it on a little bit kind of like the back burner, the, the Madrid. And a lot of people attribute the Madrid to the start of the Oslo process. So and 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 Yasser Arafat sided with Saddam Hussein, which didn't help. Right. Uh, awesome, Victor. Awesome. Do you want to join us? Well, thank you. I, I, I've been listening to Yuri. He's very knowledgeable. I hope he can speak to us again, frankly. Uh, 
I've learned a lot from his uh, tonight's lecture. I think I knew all the points, but I never got them all together. So thank I'm you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm glad, I'm glad. Talking about today, it's the same. It just got worse, that's all. <laughs> you have, now you have, you see, when I used to come to Israel to visit my friend in the 80s and the 90s, they asked me my opinion on the political situation. So I told them, listen, Israel is like a, a lunatic asylum. And one day, the loony beans decided to do a revolution and to kick up the management. So they did. A few years later, I come, they asked me, what has changed? I said, listen, the same revolution that the loony bean, the loonies did in the loony bean, they took over and they ran the institution. There was another faction who was not with them in the management after the revolution. So they revolted against the loony who was running the institution and they kicked them out. So one thing we know, the loonies are running the institution, but we don't know which faction of the loonies is running the institution. So that was my allegory to explain to them what happened in the state of Israel in the past 40 or 50 years. We know that the loonies are running the institution. We just know, we don't know which faction of them. No. Victor? Unmute you are, yourself, Victor. You are mute, Victor. Can hear you. We can't hear you, Victor. You are mute. You are mute. We can't hear you. <laughs> Victor, <laughs> you are mute. Okay, let him talk on you. That's okay. <laughs> Victor. <laughs> Victor, you're muted. You're mute. I think that's his, that's what his wife wants him to be all always. Okay. Well, I'm from your side. Okay. Uh, Jeff, okay, let's call this meeting. Uh, I want to make wanna... another another small point. I just remember it's another small, very small point, but very poignant. In 1967, right, right when the United Nations were actually trying to draft the 242 resolution about the two states, it was the famous the famous resolution 242. The the final draft, Abba even fought. To drop, to drop the word D, T-H-E, because the resolution says that Israel has to withdraw from the territories. And Abba even fought like mad, and the, the solution was ultimately withdraw from territories, not the territories. In other words, the word D was so important because they wanted to make sure in 67 already that the world doesn't want Israel to get back to the 67, the June 4, 67. So they dropped the word D on that, on that. And there was a big, a week, two weeks fight on that. Finally, they, they acquiesced and say, okay, withdraw from territories. Anyhow, I just wanted to make a point on that thing because this is a point that always befuddled me. The fight was so mighty because Israel didn't want the United Nations to say that they have to withdraw from the territories. But, Just a small point. But in the agreement with Egypt, the peace agreement with Egypt, they said that the agreement, the peace agreement is based on resolution 242 and Jimmy Carter accepted the Egypt, Egypt version of understanding of 242 that they have to withdraw from all the territories occupied from Egypt. And they but and there were there was the Jordan, there was the Jordanian part in the Golan heart, so this is not the territories, just territories. Okay, but uh, this was the Egypt Egypt. The Egyptian government under Sadat 
they say that their understanding of 242, they have to withdraw from the all occupied territory. And the United States under Jimmy Carter accepted this. This is why they forced Israel to withdraw completely to 67 border. With but Israel saved face. It was not the territories because it was just the Egyptian part. Okay, so. okay. But, um, hey, hey, you know, <laughs> this is what, and if you'll see, if will be the T-H-E, okay. you think the reality of today will be different? I'm, I'm just pointing to something that yeah. the Israeli government yeah. fought, fought very, very strongly against, vehemently against in 1967. That's all. That's a small okay. point. I have just one comment about what's happening in the U.S. that maybe it's too slow, but I believe at least inside the Democratic Party, we do see a shift. If you look 20, 30 years ago, you do see a, a change for good, but it's just too slow. Uh, you, get, you can get today 70, 80, or maybe 100 Congress people from the Democratic Party only, because the evangelists don't influence them at all. They don't have no influence over the Democratic Party. So you do see more uh, sensitivity or more sympathy to the Palestinian rights, but still they don't have enough power, or it's not in the first priority. But if you ask a group of Congress people in Democratic Party to sign a petition or to make a statement or do this and this, they, they all do it, you know, but this, it's end up of only signing their name and then say there is no any uh, movement that go ar around this. Okay, Yossi, the, yeah. assuming that Diane Feinstein retires, which it looks like, there I think are four people who are up for her, who are looking for her seat. Well, right I, now, officially, is only one, officially. Okay, only one is Katie Porter, but there's certainly right. gonna be... Uh, 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 Adam Schiff. Maybe. Adam you know. Schiff, Rokana, and uh, Swalwell, at least. And no, also... So for, anyway, from, from our point of view for Israel-Palestine, uh, which one of those should you support? I have no Doesn't idea. Doesn't make any difference. I don't know what, they will be better than Diane Feinstein, for sure. Well, Diane Feinstein not, was way not, better than Barbara Boxer. Not Adam Schiff, but uh, Rokana or Katie Porter, or maybe I heard that Barbara Lee also thinking, consider this from the Bay Area. She's too old. That's a matter. I'm just saying she's also. Ah, okay. You know, I don't know. We Jeff, never. We never. Jeff, have. even though they're senator from California, they're one out of the hundred. Yeah, no. no, I understand that. But as Yossi said, it's it, the 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 needle is moving. It's it's a moving. It's but it's too slow for us. But this is America. Everything Listen. is moving slow here. Everything. Take Barbara Lee. Barbara Lee would be the great one, but. She is 76 years old. She, nobody's going to vote for her. Uh, maybe Katie Porter. We should go and talk to I'm, her. I'm, I'm sending her money. I send her money already. I, I'm I, I also send her money, $100. I like her. But I don't know what she think about this. She'll be, she'll be very careful. But she'll be better than Feinstein, this for sure. You know? Feinstein is moving, old, old guard uh, demo Democrats, Democrats. Okay, anyway, Victor, you were muted when you gave your speech a few minutes ago. Now you're unmuted, so I can invite you, you to I give it again. Question. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we yes. hear you now. Oh, so, somebody mute me here, so I, did, I took it off of her. Uh, we got a problem, and that was from Pinhas Sapir in the 1967 when he said, we got a problem of reproduction. Are we planning anything to stop the reproduction of the Palestinians? So somebody suggests maybe we should put one soldier in each house and make sure the woman takes a pill at night before <laughs> she sleeps with her husband. It's not a joke. What's the truth? That's not a joke. It's the truth. Uh, just to give you a point about it, 
since 1948, in the past 75 years, the 1948 Arabs, the Israeli Arabs, those that are citizens of Israel, the average birth rate per woman dropped from about 7.5 to about 3.2. So it has to do with economic advancement and opportunities. And a lot of Arab women in Israel got an economic opportunities that impacted the size of the families. They are a whole lot smaller than they used to be their mothers and grandmothers. So the Palestinians are not, and the ultra-Orthodox not. But other sections of the Israeli populace, the more the economy thrives, the lesser kids they have, generally speaking. That's a in, 19, in 1948, after the Nakba, the Palestinians made up about 12 or 13% of the Israeli population. Now, with a million Russians and all kinds of other immigrants, they're 20 or 21 percent. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely, yeah. But there's a change. The, the, as they got integrated into the Israeli society and they got more opportunities economically, as they advance economically, they show, they, they see the graph dropping, continuously dropping. Yeah, that's all around the world. Okay, yes. let's, uh, uh, if no one, let me Judy, everybody interrupt me. Thank you. Let me Judy, did you have your hand up? Uh, to, I was talking, I was interrupted. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Victor, keep going. Everybody give me a uh, Uri, I have a question to your question now. Are you, for the 242 solution completely, that we're supposed to return every millimeter of the land that we occupied in 1967, the six days war, or no? It's including irrelevant. Syria, including everything. Are it's you for that or not? It's completely, completely irrelevant conversation. No, no, it's a simple question. No, it's but I'm telling you, it's simple. an irrelevant conversation. No, no. Right now. Actually, my question, where are you standing? Are I'm you sitting, I'm not standing. I'm basically. No, no, I know, I thinking. see you sitting. <laughs> I see, where are you standing in your point of view? Are you willing to. I'm saying basically anything? it's an old conversation. The conversation is very simple. Whatever the United States decides, that's what's going to happen because the United States gives the umbrella in the United Nations Security Council. That's the point. As long as the United States provides it, nothing is going to happen there, regardless of the for two and all that. That's what I said at the beginning before we started the conversation. That's what huh? I said at the beginning. That's what I said to you at the beginning before we started the conversation. They support everything. They decide everything and we follow. But one thing, we are fighting together with the American against the Arab country, like a Syria, like a Iran. We are fighting every day, preparing ourselves to war with Iran. That's nothing to do with the politician was going in Jerusalem. It's two different entities. Do we agree on that? I didn't follow the whole the whole argument. Okay, back and I repeat again. Are we there's two different governments. One that fight with the American people against Syria, Libya, uh, not Libya, Syria and Iran preparing. And that is something different from what's happening in Jerusalem in with the Palestinians. Two different entities and what's happening. Because the, the previous prime minister was following the same footsteps. Nothing has been changed. Nothing changed. The only thing he changed in the, the parliament, the little democracy, the bullshitting us. That's okay. We are used to bullshit. It will be demo. We're playing game. We are playing, and we're going to continue playing game. As far as they support us in money, banking, and everything, we will follow their orders. The moment the money is not there, it's over the game. The game is over. You and me know that. That's correct? Yeah. Let me show you, Victor. When I came to the United States, they showed me, it says on the $20 bill, it says, in God we trust. They said, this is our God, and we trust in this God. This is the American motto. Everything else is conversation. So I'm basically telling you, it's Pax Americana. We are running the world. We have the money. As long as we do that, we'll do whatever we want. So... 242338, who cares? We decide. We want to invade Iraq, we'll invade Iraq. 
I agree. Okay. So so me. We finally agree each other with each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dick. I'm done. I'm done. Uh, Whatever you're going to say, it's not going to help. Continue. Okay, well, this is a question for Uri. Things are changing, though. I mean, I listened to a podcast by there's this guy, Ben Norton. He calls it multiple. Say, I, I didn't hear you. Say it again. I'm sorry. Well, here is uh, the, the era of the Pax Americana, I think, is numbered. The, Maybe. The, the U.S. Maybe. The, the, I mean, the U.S. is kind of ruled by having the dollar as the reserve yes. currency. This yes. is changing with the yuan and uh, people... Uh, having foreign trade in their own currencies rather than the dollars. Uh, if the United States needed to uh, have the draft again and send more than just uh, National Guard units and CIA trainers into Ukraine, I think they would have a, some kind of a rebellion on their hand. I don't think uh, many Americans uh, would agree to be drafted and to go fight in the Ukraine. No. So, so, no, I so, agree. I, I mean, uh, I, you know, yes, there's the a only thing, kind of send part. the money. Send yeah, the but money. How, in other words, how long will this reality continue? You know, I see a lot of changes already happening. No, you got a good point. Is, uh, it did. I don't There's see. There's a good point. Wait, wait, wait a second, Yossi. There's a good yeah. point on this thing, uh, Dick. The point is very simple. As long as the United States is the currency of the world, it's going to persist. Russia, China, India, Brazil. South Africa and a few other countries 10, 15 years ago started talking about having a competition, some kind <clears throat> of something like a euro. <clears throat> Hasn't happened yet. The moment well, it happens <clears throat> and the United States cannot print the money of the world, things will change. Up to that point, I don't know what's going to happen next year, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. I have no idea. Nobody knows. But the world, especially China, they realized the moment the United States kicked the Russians after Ukraine from the international banking system, that's when the Chinese realized their fears. They know that the United States can do that to them, theoretically at least. And I agree with you. That, that's the direction the world is going. Sooner or later, the dollar will not be the only currency in the world. Up till now, this is it. This is what gives America the power. We can print money freely, 31 trillion, 32 trillion, who cares? We export inflation to the world. Well, you we have to pay it. We have to pay for that. Don't play game. Some pocket is going to come the $32 trillion to return. It. It's going to be your money and my money. You know that. They're it's not going to pay. It. Forget about it. it. It's Forget not about money, it. uh, Victor. <laughs> Yossi, did you want to contribute here? Yeah, I just wanted to say that I heard this theory that the United States in decline in the Middle East. I see the contrary. Two, three years ago, Trump arranged what they call Abraham Initiative, which made peace, so-called peace between Israel, Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, and almost uh, Qatar. Oh. You know, which Netanyahu said, you telling me, this is what his argument was, that as long I don't fix the Palestinian issue, all the gates in the Arab world will be closed to me. Look what happened on the, uh, the opposite. Now I have business with United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and indirectly with Qatar, and maybe soon will be with Saudi Arabia. So, and this is because of the influence of United States over those countries to push them to do it with Israel. Biden, he did not reverse this. He, on, on the contrary, he continued this and pushing for expanding the Abraham Initiative. And this is under influence of the United States. So you see in the Middle East, that basically is the only power that dictate what's gonna happen. The only thing that Russia has is a broken, falling apart states of Syria. They have no influence in the Arab world, Syria, today. And, and, and they are the last world in uh, Iraq and in Egypt. 
and they have influence over them. You know, maybe they in decline in other part, but not in the Middle East. In the Middle East, they're only getting- What about Saudi Arabia, Yossi? Huh? What about Saudi Arabia? They uh, have not cooperated with the sanctions on the Ukraine. And now uh, China is the biggest uh, consumer uh, of, Saudi, of Saudi Arabia. You know, I can Are call you it- the US is yep. I can call it a debate between friends. United mm -hmm. States and Saudi Arabia are still allies in the Middle East. And if they have disagreement over Ukraine, so what? Even Israel is not following 100% US policy on Ukraine. So it make uh, them less uh, influence over Israel? No. So they have this, like they said, we have disagreement of friends. This is really is all about, you know. Also, Israel is not following the sanction on uh, Russia because they have business with Russia. You know, Netanyahu and Putin a uh, body body, Victor. The very close. I, I, to I know where you're going. I know where you're going. Not only no. talking that issue. I'm talking about reality. reality. This is the reality. This is why uh, Netanyahu used Putin picture in a head. I know. I saw them. I saw them. Putin and Trump together. He said, they, "Look, they were kissing each other." Right. <laughs> now I have a question. I support John Kennedy in 1962. I support John Kennedy, and he was right for what he did. He didn't want to have any missiles 90 miles from his territory, from Cuba to the United States, and he was right 100%. No argue about that. He didn't want to have any military base from Russia in North South America, and he's right. He's entitled to that right. He doesn't want any Chinese at all, besides business, to appoint any missiles to the United States, and he's right. He's protecting his country. To Gorbachev, they gave him a promise when he was going up, George Bush, the old man, that not even one meter NATO will move from the territory next to the border. And was promised verbally, of course. You know what's a verbally for the United States? Zero value. Today, they were pushing Ukraine to be a member of NATO. Be a member of NATO, it's mean missiles and everything in their territory. The same they do it in Hungary, they do it in Poland, they do it in Romania, and other more countries they're doing it. And that is not the, the resolution, the accord they have. They trade Gorbachev, all the promise is gone. So we got a problem. They have a, not me, I don't have a problem. I don't live in there. So they don't want nobody in, next to their border. I'm very close to Ukraine. Like 2014, there was an agreement. It was that agreement. Now, at the end, we find out that the Prime Minister of Germany and friend, the President of France, they lied to everyone openly. They lied. They said, let them have the accord and let air reinforce Ukraine with weapons to start for the right moment. Nobody said that. Nobody want to mention that. And this is a problem that we have to live today. I, I agree with Victor, and so does John Mearsheimer. I'm sorry? <laughs> yeah. I said I agree with, you, with what you're pointing out, Victor, and so does John Mearsheimer. Yeah. We are in a situation that is worse than Israel and the Palestinians. Annihilation completely of the world. Because Russia is not going to give up his right not to have anybody next to his border with weapons pointing to to, to Russia. And, and, now, and it's not that and, I love Putin, I don't love him. But one thing for sure, he said, right, I don't want to allow any more soldiers, strange soldiers, in my land. He lost all his family in the Second World too. No matter what religion, what he professed, but he, like we let, let the same thing that happened with Vietnam. There was no communism to fight. There was patriotism. They were in a reunited country. The same topic in Korea. They didn't let him. So we got the same situation right now. Jeff, are we, going we to meandered. Do? We moved out of the Middle East to handling the world. It's time no, to call it off. I'm going to tell you one secret. 1965, I was marching in Haifa for the peace in Vietnam. People were looking at me and everybody. What do you have to do Vietnam with the Palestinians? Everything is related. Every world is around in the world, 
is related to our war. We're supposed to find solutions to every war, not let it grow up. If we don't find solution there, you cannot find a solution in Palestine. There's no solution without solving the possibility problem with Ukraine. There won't be no solution. I'm telling you now, because there won't be no world to support. Okay. Jeff, time to close it out. Okay, folks. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you, Uri. That was a, the, the your 40 minute presentation of whatever it was, was really cogent and excellent. And uh, I, have enough, I have enough material for another four hour seminar, but yeah. In fact, if you write that up, I think that would be a, 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 a good primer that a lot of people would, in, would appreciate if that was written up. I would need some help because I'm not that good at that. I'll give you the points. If you can work with me, we can do that. Okay. All right. I've worked with Yossi on stuff. I'll work with you. Thank you. Okay. So thank you, everybody. And we'll see you uh, in a month. I won't be here in a month. I'll be in an operation. Uh, uh, Thayer will be our talker and uh, our guest. And uh, Tony Litwinka will be the host. Great. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Sorry. Bye. Bye. Bye.